Hi, I'm Dr. Mamari, and I'm going to uh, perform the experiment, week three of the experiment, qualitative analysis of group three. This is for the known ions, so or known solution. What does it mean, known solution? Again, it means that we already know our solution contains five ions. And we are going to practice, look at these ions, how they behave, with different reagents. Um, you see those five ions. I'm going to pull up the chart soon, and you will see those ions. They are coming from transition metals. Transition met metals, they have colored compounds, or they produce colored compounds. So basically, our qualitative analysis is going to be based on the uh, presence of specific color with the specific reagent when you have one of these ions present. Is a practice to train our eyes and our thoughts so we can uh, we can identify if there is any of those when when an unknown solution is given to us that we don't know if the unknown solution contains only one of these five two three or four or all five of them we can identify them based on the evidences or the observation we have for this uh, practice today so make sure you have your lab notebook ready at this time you have purchased your lab manual from vital source because i'm not covering everything from the experiment I'm only talking about why we are doing this experiment and i'm going to provide you with uh, data or observation is not the numerical value it's just the observation so you can record those observation in your lab notebook and then try to understand it using your lab manual and also uh, be able to turn in your data sheet as an assignment to your professor. If I'm teaching the course, you will be seeing me again. If not, uh, your, your professor might hold a uh, mini sections with Blackboard Collaborate um, and explain more about the um, theory of the experiment or the reactions. Um, that's not the scope of this practice. This is just for you uh, because of the remote teaching or remote learning, um, because you cannot be here you are going to uh, watch the video and uh, record your uh, record your observation. The uh, let me uh, share the the document with you. These groups actually they are known as the sulfide groups, uh, but that means that if we had the sulfide ion, they will precipitate. If they are mixed with other groups, let's say if they are mixed with the group two and one which we had practice in week one and two uh, but uh, we don't want to separate them from from the other group by addition of the sulfide ion so we just treat them as a separate group um, as so we have all of them it's, it's like five of them in one uh, solution as a practice so we don't mix with group one and two if we had mixed them with group one and two then we had to deal with sulfide um, compound of this not very pleasant order so that's why it's separated um, the chart should be your friend we learn a lot from by looking at the chart see that we have five of these ions the first thing you're going to do add the sodium hydroxide when you add sodium hydroxide some of them selectively so you learn about like selective precipitation of these um, precipitates are stable in basic solution. Um, they are insoluble of uh, the compounds. If you acidify it, it goes back into solution. So if you add sodium hydroxide, um, the iron, nickel, and mang manganese is going to precipitate. And if you add acid, they go back to, uh, to solution. In a basic solution, your zinc and chromium is not going to precipitate, so it stays in the, in the solution. So when you look at the chart, after adding any reagent which shows in the vertical line you will see that it says either s or aq aq means this complex is soluble in the basic solution but if you have the um, you have in a basic solution these compounds are insoluble and they form a solid compound and then the next step so you're going to learn about the chart and how to uh, navigate through the chart 
and be able to answer questions on the pre-lab assignments or the uh, post-lab questions, and also perform the experiments in order to record your observation. These empty boxes, they are, they are there for you to write your observation, but they are too tiny, and it doesn't give you a detailed observation for each step of the experiment. So I ask my students to create a table again, uh, to have a place for observation or write in paragraph format. Um, so after each step, they leave like two, three lines empty to write the observation, what has happened, what color change. And I use this um, usually when we are we have face-to-face -face class, um, when it's asking, make sure your professor initialize it, uh, that yes, you did do this experiment because it's known and uh, we want to make sure that everyone actually could see that has to do with the color present or evidence of the reaction present to confirm so you are not studying or you're not recording wrong observation when you are doing. Uh, so you need to use it for uh, unknown. You don't want to have the wrong information. Because when you are working with the unknown, you have to depend on your friend, which is your lab notebook, and your lab notebook should have proper and correct uh, observation. So um, that is the the flowchart that we are going to um, we are going to follow. Now it's time for uh, procedure. When we talk about procedure, I'm not going to go over all of these or each of these reactions but you are going to learn about those reactions by reading the, the, the lab manual. Basically, it says when you have iron and you add hydroxide, it gives you precipitate, the iron hydroxide precipitate, or nickel and manganese the same way, but zinc and is the, the, it, the summary of these reactions is presented in the chart, but we want to make sure that we have the you know, have to write these equations because when you write these equations, you learn everything about this um, reactions. And in case you get those as the um, exam question, then you know how to answer those questions. Very good. So, I'm uh, going to stop sharing the document. I follow the procedure from the lab manual that I have here, hard copy, and I start performing the um, experiment for you. Okay, now you should follow me. That's one of the experiments. That is the 3A1 experiment. Start hot water bath. Okay, ready to start with the hot water bath. I already started actually. I have the hot water bath going on there on the bench. Use my gloves because dealing with strong acids and bases, we have to have protection. Okay. Um, 10 drops of the known cation solution. So we're going to take the 10 drops of the known group 3. I have the group 3 known solutions. I get 10 drops of it. Very colorful solution because of those transition metals that we have, uh, we have in there. And we are going to add sodium hydroxide and we are going to and the hot water sodium hydroxide and hot water fifteen drops of Fifteen. Fifteen drops of the uh, sodium hydroxide and five drops of hot water. Dropper.
Okay, so we have a mixture. I want you to record your observation. We have a mixture of solid liquid. So with the mixture of solid liquid that we have here, next step would be to separate them. So we have to, I, I want to mix it well, so all of the, the three ions that they precipitate in the basic solution would go into the, into the solid form. So it's mixed properly. Then we need to, in order to separate the aqueous solution, we need to centrifuge it, just like the last experiment. Whenever we have a mixture of solid and liquid, we are going to centrifuge when the solid is completely settled down. Then we will. Um, then we will decant. The procedure is going to tell us if we have both solid and liquid, or we only need one. And based on the procedure, we are going to keep uh, both or discard one. In this step, since the liquid portion is going to contain the zinc and chromium, and the solid one is going to contain iron, zinc, and the manganese, we have to save both of them in two separate test tubes. Okay. Time it like for 30, between 30 seconds to one minute and turn it off. Wait until centrifuge stops. Take it out, make that it's separated completely. If it's separated completely, then I would uh, That's the, the difference between the lecture and the lab. For the lab, sometimes we have to wait for things to happen. And we have to be very patient. We have to have uh, you know, uh, common sense. Um, we cannot rush. So you, you might see me like pausing. You might see me waiting. If you were in the lab, you were waiting just that since you were working with your lab partner, then you start talking about everything else in the life. You don't feel like you're waiting, but I'm sure you will have to wait. You have to wait for a few minutes for the centrifuge to stop and all that. Next step on part A, um, 3A3, it says, if the solution is cloudy, add additional sodium hydroxide, but since the solution is not cloudy, I don't have to add additional sodium hydroxide, so I'm going to move to the next step, which is part 3B, which is oxidation of the uh, oxidation of uh, chromium. So, You know what? I'm going to. I have to look for the zinc. I keep track of where is the zinc.
Save some of it just in case. We need to sample one for zinc. Okay. So we're going to add the um, hydrogen peroxide solution and mix it and look for yellow color. If yellow color appears, that means we have chromium, but it's not confirmed. So I'm adding hydrogen peroxide, and I want you to see the color change if what's happening here. There is a yellow color. I uh, don't know if it's better with the what color background. Maybe the white background. That tan color that you have there that shows that we have chromium, but it's not confirmed. So we are not done with confirming presence of chromium, but we are uh, expecting that we do have chromium. If, if you read the experiment entirely, before watching this, you expect this, you know, waiting time for the for the next step. This is not the final step for uh, for chromium. Now we are done with the part three, B two, which is the yellow color for chromium. Now, part three C. In part three C, we are going to dissolve the hydroxide. And in order to dissolve the hydroxide, uh, we take the precipitate this is from the um, 3A, and we add HCl. We add HCl to the precipitate. Remember from the chart, when you add the sodium hydroxide, you get the precipitate. When you add the HCl, it goes back into the uh, solution. So we are going to add nitric acid 15 drops and we are going to heat the mixture for two minutes until all the solid is dissolved okay so 15 drops of hno3 we have to work inside the fume hood because of the strong acids and strong bases that we are dealing with nature of the chemicals and I don't like to keep everything in the fume hood, so we go back and forth. So we add the 15 drops, just count the drops. We have 15 drops of the acid, then we are going to place in the hot water bath. Place in hot water bath. And Wait for two minutes. We want to make sure that the precipitate dissolves again. to use stirring rod to mix it. Okay. Just one more minute of mixing, of eating. So we are done with part 3C, everything dissolved for part 
3C2, so add 15 drops of water to the solution, let it cool, and pour, pour it into three clean test tubes because you want to identify three ions, so we have to divide the solution into three separate test tubes. This solution doesn't have any precipitate. You can record your observation. This is after heating up. If I see any cloudy particles or particles that makes the solution cloudy, I have to centrifuge and separate because I don't want any precipitate in there. But it's not colorless, but at the same time, it's clear. There is no particle there. I can avoid centrifuging. I added the 15 drops of DI water. Now, uh, part 3C2. Part 3C2, I'm going to um, divide these into three separate test tubes. Dropper. It's easier than pouring. It's more manageable for me to use the dropper rather than pouring because when I pour, yes, it might go all in one test tube, and then I have to take it back or spill. Uh, but with the dropper, it's easier. It's more manageable. So I'm going to add. So we want to make like even, all three test tubes even. I can hold it, three of them together and take some from one, add to two, add to three, in order to divide into three test tubes. Three D. Three D confirmation of Fe three plus. So this is part for part three D confirmation for Fe three plus. We are going to take one of the test tubes and add potassium cyanide, 0.2 molar potassium cyanide, to the first hour grid, and we want to just add two drops of it. If we get like a, we are testing for iron. Iron, it gives that red color. So if that bloody red color appears, that means we have iron. Now, I should not get too excited about this because I already know that I have iron. But if we were working with the unknown solution, if we had the unknown solution, and we add the potassium, uh, is it potassium tyrosine? Yes. If we add the two drops of potassium tyrosine, KSCN, um, this is for part D3, D1, formation of that bloody red color, presence of. I so record your observation. What is positive test for presence of iron? So we already figured out one of the five. We have iron. We finished with that. Then for part E, three E, we want to separate the nickel from nickel from uh, we want to separate nickel so 
we want to add ammonium hydroxide to the second uh, aliquot. We are going to test for nickel now. Nickel can give you a precipitate or it can give you a new color. But sometimes if you have iron and manganese in there, it can hinder or it can cause some, uh, as impurity, um, it can interfere with the color that nickel is going to show. So we're going to remove any, um, any of the um, iron and manganese that's in there because we know there are iron and manganese in there, definitely. So by adding ammonia, we are going to get the, uh, we add enough ammonia until it is uh, basic. And when we add ammonia, we can remove the iron and manganese. So we are going to add ammonia, NH3, or NH4, NH3. See, turns cloudy. Basically, iron and manganese is precipitating now. Uh, because nickel with ammonia does not percept it. Nickel stays in the solution. Pay attention to the chemical reaction, please. Just going to add five drops extra, so I know for sure that all of the manganese and uh, iron has precipitated. So after I addition of the ammonia, the precipitate part, the solid part, is iron hydroxide and manganese hydroxide. So it makes the solution basic, it provides the OH, and that OH is going to react with the iron and manganese. So we get one more time, we get uh, iron hydroxide and manganese hydroxide. How is this different from the first step? In the first step, nickel hydroxide would precipitate also because we add the sodium hydroxide. In this step, nickel does not precipitate because it forms a complex that is soluble in the aqueous solution. So you don't worry about the nickel precipitating again. Nickel stays in the solution, only iron and manganese, it goes to the solid. If you want to record anything after your observation for week three, please do so today. Because week four, if you were in the lab and you were doing experiment, I would not answer any questions because all the questions needs to be answered for um, for week three when you are working with the known sample. Now, if any part is not clear while you are watching the video, while you are uh, recording your observation to answer the post questions for week three, make sure to ask your professor to clarify it before you go to week four and um, dealing with the unknown. Because for when we are dealing with the unknown, I'm not supposed to explain what is happening in the step because you are supposed to identify which ions are present and which ions are absent. So I only explained it in this step. So what do we have in the clear solution? It would be nickel. What we have in the solid portion is the iron and manganese that we don't want it at this point. We don't want that to interfere with the nickel. So we take the aqueous solution part, only the clear part, transfer to a new test tube. New, I mean by new, uh, I mean by new is clear. Uh, clean test tube. And the test tubes that I've done, I have a separate test tube track that I 
place it there so I don't get confused with which one was used. And if you were working with your lab partner, you want to make sure to label each one what part is it is because you don't want your lab partner to move the uh, to the wrong place. Okay. To confirm, we have nickel in part 3F. We are going to add the reagent H2DMG, dimethyl glycin reagent. With the dimethyl glycin reagent, we get like a strawberry color, strawberry red color. If we get that, that is going to be the, uh, showing the presence of uh, presence of the nickel. So we can add four drops of it. We can have the hot water bag and lower it at least. The diagline. Where is the diagline? Okay. If there is nickel here, which we know it is, by adding the reagent H2DMG, we should get strawberry red color. Okay, Let's see. That is the color. It shows we have nickel. So I'm going to wait for you to record your observation. Record your observation for presence of nickel. And this is the color. Okay? That's the color that is for me. Done with two. We know iron with that bloody red color. We know the nickel with that strawberry red color. Moving to three. Confirmation four manganese and we want to make sure that the solution is acidic and we are going to add a reagent that is going to show specific color the specific color for Manganese. I just want to make sure I don't have to remove the nickel and iron from this. Uh, it's like, yeah. Okay. We're going to add water, 10 drops of water, add nitric acid. We can add nitric acid. to make sure the solution is acidic. Following the procedure, I'm adding the nitric acid before adding by a reagent, the solid reagent of NABIO3, okay? Sodium bismuthate. So I'm going to Add the small portion of solid biscuit. Formation of a purple color permanganate. It shows that we do have MN. The purple color, hope you see the purple color. And if you don't see the purple color, maybe the white background is gonna help you. Or, I don't know, what direction should I stay? So, hopefully you see the purple color. Okay, I see from the camera, I see the purple color. So, the purple color that forms, it shows we have permanganate. If it's hard for you to see permanganate, the, the purple color, then you centrifuge it. If you wait too long, it's going to, um, reaction can take place, oxidation reduction can take place, and it changes to uh, manganese dioxide, which is a brown color. But a shade of a purple color still would be sufficient. But if you review it right, right away, you look for the evidence and you mark your observation that you have purple color after adding sodium bismuthate, you have this purple color formation of purple color that indicates presence of MN.
Next step, 3H, we want to look for confirmation of chromium. Remember, I said this color, it shows that we do have chromium, but it's not confirmed. So it must confirm. Uh, the solution is, in this step, is to destroy any excess of the, um, so we are going to, we are going to heat it up. We don't want any leftover of hydrogen peroxide, so we are going to put it in hot water and heat it up. And great to show you. Maybe you can see those bubbles that is forming. Tell me if you see those bubbles in the test tube that it's forming. That's basically the hydrogen peroxide that's being. Uh, is being decomposed, changes to H2O and O2. The bubbles, that's the extra hydrogen peroxide that is being decomposed. We don't want the hydrogen peroxide in there, so we leave it in the hot water that until there is no more bubbles. Okay. Wow. So much extra. Okay. It stops forming bubbles. So I'm going to add barium chloride. When I add barium chloride, I just want to look at quantity, how many drops of barium chloride before uh, five drops of barium chloride. When we add barium chloride, if we have chromium here, it's going to give you barium chromate. So barium chloride. My barium chloride it's here. A pale yellow color, precipitate, meaning that barium chromate has formed. So it is cloudy, is not very obvious, just going to give some time. And centrifuge. So when we centrifuge, you can see that precipitate forming. Test it with water. Okay. You see the difference? Not. I'm not talking about the color. I'm talking about how cloudy this test tube is and how clear and transparent. So when you are comparing the two test tubes, you could see easier that yes, there is a precipitate in there. So we have precipitate of the barium uh, chromate. I'm going to centrifuge it so you will see all collected at the bottom of the test tube. But even without centrifuge, you could see that, yes, it's not transparent. So centrifuge. Going to allow it to centrifuge.
See that color? That is the precipitate which formed when we add the barium chloride. Record your observations. This is the confirmation you do have chromium. So, bloody red color for iron, strawberry red color for nickel, purple color for manganese, and this tan color, yellow tan color, brownish color, whatever you want to call, uh, for your unknown, it would behave very similar. The amount of the precipitate that you might have, it would be different, but the color should be almost the same. Um, that's for chromium. Going to separate the solution. We don't need the precipitate for chromium, and we are keeping this for the for zinc for zincine. That's the last one for the zincine. So we want to add HCl to this and stir it because you might get like hydrogen gas being released here. So we are going to add the HCl. You want to make sure you add enough HCl until it's acidic. How do we make sure it's acidic? We are going to use the blue litmus paper. Let me have everything ready before I add the HCl. I'm going to have the blue litmus paper in a watch glass. Here I mix with HCl. <clears throat> then I take a drop of it, place on the um, litmus paper to see if the color is going to change from blue color to pink color. Going to mix it well. Take a drop and place it on the blue litmus paper. Blue litmus paper, it changed color to pink, so it is acidic. But we make sure it is acidic. When we add the uh, potassium um, ferric nitrate, or is it ferrous nitrate, FECN6, um, so we are going to add that four drops. We are going to centrifuge and a yellow color precipitate is expected. So we're going to add the reagent and centrifuge. I add the reagent. Again, if you don't look at the color and you look at the transparency, you can see that it's not transparent anymore. See? It's not transparent anymore. Precipitate doesn't show, just like the previous one. Chromium, it didn't show to begin with. But when you centrifuge, it's going to settle and show the um, precipitate. that everything is, is added. Presence of iron and zinc in this one is going to um, affect the color, but 
if you have with this reagent if you do have um, you have the zinc without any iron or manganese you would get that color the yellow color so I think I give enough time because I have to give time for precipitate to form balance the test tubes and place in centrifuge okay this is basically the last to identify zinc. And the last line it says if you have iron in the mixture you would get like the bluish tint color and the precipitate is right there the color it's kind of bluish because we know that we had iron so make sure to record your observation and say that the precipitate has formed but because of presence of the iron um, the tint the bluish color it appears here as the presence of iron. So if you have the precipitate, that means zinc is there. And if you have yellow color only, if that means the, there is no iron in there. But if the precipitate turns like bluish tint color, that means there is zinc, also iron. So iron interferes with the color. OK? So the precipitate that is formed there, it shows we have zinc. Okay, that was the last of the five ions that you identified for uh, presence of them in the known solution, which we knew they are there. But the purpose of the experiment for you is to get ready to identify your unknown. And for me is to make sure that you have access to this while you are taking your class um, online or remote. Uh, learning uh, because you cannot be here you have the uh, you have these um, these options so we try to maximize the uh, use of the condition that we are in okay thank you and I'm going to stop recording <laughs>